Church, an open place for all. I'm Claire Holloway. I'm Kyle Holloway, and this is Riley. <laughs> We've been attending First Church for a couple years now, and what we love about First Church is that it's provided us a great community of people to spend time with, and we love that First Church is not afraid to ask the tough questions. Don't forget to sign in.
My name is Katie Gilbert, and I serve as our executive pastor. And I'd like to take just a moment to share a couple of announcements about things happening in the life here at First Church. The first is that we hope you have made note of our pilgrimages, which are happening on the first Saturdays of each month. Our next pilgrimage will take place on Saturday, November 6th, and we will journey together to Selma, Alabama, where we will be taking the Footprints to Freedom Tour, which includes a visit to the National Voting Rights Museum and Institute, the Slavery and Civil War Museum, Brown Chapel AME, and of course, a walk across the historic Edmund Pettus Bridge. Please note that the deadline to register to join us is October 29th. The cost for adults is $35 each, which covers the entry fees into each of those museums we will visit together. If you'd like to join us as we head out on our Selma pilgrimage, you're invited to register under our coming up tab and clicking on that pilgrimage slide. We hope you'll join us as together we remember and experience transformation together. Our second announcement is that we are excited to be partnering once again with Community on the Rise to offer our Advent box for you to practice and celebrate the season of Advent in your own home. Boxes will be $25 each and will include greenery along with an Advent wreath plate, your Advent candles that you will need to light from week to week, an oil blend, a set of five note cards with a beautiful watercolor of First Church by our own Caleb Clark, and of course, a recycled number five plastic ornament. We are so excited about these boxes and we hope you'll take the opportunity to bring one home for your celebrations this season today. You can order your box by visiting our coming up tab and clicking on that Advent box slide. Please note, if you'd like to customize your box even further, you're welcome to reach out to Avery Rhodes at Community on the Rise. Last but not least, our All Saints Celebration Sunday will be on November 7th. As a part of that service, we would like to honor and remember the names of all the beloved people who have died within the past year in your life. You are invited to share the names and pictures of those persons that you have lost in the last year with our church administrator, Peg Thompson. You can reach her by email at peg at firstchurchbhm.com. We know that this will be a special day to remember those that we love and those that we hold close. Even though they may not be with us physically present on this earth anymore, we honor and celebrate their memory on this day. We invite you to participate. Friends, with these announcements shared, I invite you now to join me in prayer. God of love, we give thanks for today, for the beauty that surrounds us, for everything we have to be grateful for this morning. We pray that as we move into our time of worship, you will help to center us, help us to breathe deep, to feel grounded, and to tune in to the oneness that you are calling us to hear and see all around. We ask all of this in your name. Amen.
Our first scripture reading for today will come from Psalm 46. Here are these words. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth should change. The mountains shake in the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble with a tumult. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy habitation of the Most High. God is in the midst of the city. It shall not be moved. God will help it when the morning dawns. The nations are in an uproar. The kingdoms totter. He utters his voice. The earth melts. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Come, behold the works of the Lord. See what desolation he has brought on the earth. He makes war cease to the ends of the earth. He breaks the bow and he shatters the spear. He burns the shields with fire. He be still and know that I am God. I am exalted among the nations. I am exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. This time, will you please join me in prayer? Let us pray. Creator God, we thank you for who you are. We thank you for constantly reminding us of your strength and the power, and most of all, your love and compassion for us. God, as we worship together in this virtual setting, remind us, though we may be scattered, that we are still one body, one church. And God, I ask that you be with us in these moments of uncertainty, moments of busyness and stress, moments where it is hard to slow down and see you reflected in the mountains and the rain and the wind, where it's hard to see you all around us. God, I ask you to open our eyes, allow us to remind ourselves of who you've called us to be, to be love in this world. And God, in these moments where it's difficult to see, call us to be your people. Call us to be your people in ways that we humble ourselves, seeking refuge in you, reminding ourselves that we do not have to have it all together all the time, and we don't have to do this on our, on our own. Thank you for being our strength and our refuge. Thank you for, pro for providing places of shelter and rest. Thank you for Sabbath. And so God, in this day, I ask that you constantly remind us that you are near. And as one body and one people, let us pray the prayer that your son Jesus taught us. Our Father, Mother, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us of our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
For the second scripture readings, hear now these words from the book of Revelation, first from chapter 21, verses 1 through 5. Then I saw a new earth with no oceans and a new sky, for the present earth and sky had disappeared. And I, John, saw the holy city, a new Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven. It was a glorious sight, beautiful as a bride at her wedding. I heard a loud shout from the throne saying, Look, the home of God is now among men, and he will live with them, and they will be his people. Yes, God himself will be among them. He will wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, no sorrow, nor crying, nor pain. All of that has gone forever. And the one sitting on the throne said, See, I am making all things new. And now from the book of Revelation, chapter 22, verses 1 through 5. And he pointed out to me a river of pure water of life, clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and the Lamb, coursing down the center of the main street. On each side of the river grew trees of life, bearing 12 crops of fruit, with a fresh crop for each month. The leaves were used for medicine to heal the nations. There shall be nothing in the city that is evil, for the throne of God and of the Lamb will be there, and his servants will worship him. And they shall see his face, and his name shall be written on their foreheads. And there will be no night there, no need for lamps or sun, for the Lord God will be their light, and they will, shall reign forever and ever. And now, as we move into our time of offering, I hope that you will prayerfully give. Out of the ruins and rubble i mm-hmm. 
I grew up attending the same Methodist church that my grandparents attended. My parents were married there, and then Steve and I were married there. And my grandfather was a staple in the choir and a favorite soloist at Christmas Eve services and celebrations of life. It's in part because of him and my ability to recall his melody that from time to time I have to wipe a tear from my eye when we sing an old favorite like His Eyes Upon the Sparrow or another old hymn. I know that when we reach a sermon series like this one, he would have really loved to help me dig into the faith we sing. In our family, we have a wide range of musical taste. Georgia, well, she likes indie pop, more edgy, obscure bands that have a variety of sounds, and she also has a strong love for male English ballad singers. Sawyer loves all old country like the Charlie Daniels Band, Marshall Tucker Band, and Alabama. Steve likes anybody with teased hair and black eyeliner. Metal bands, hair bands like Rat, Metallica, and Guns N' Roses. And I am more of a country lady pop or folk artist. Indigo Girls, Pink, Luke Bryan. But ultimately for me, it comes down to the words. Are they authentic? Do they resonate with my lived experience? For Steve, it's the music. Does the melody and sound move him? This sermon series, I hope, has been helping us to see that both are invaluable and together are what make music so healing and powerful. In worship, we don't just hear our faith explained through sermons, prayers, and scripture, but it is sung in our hymns and songs. We take deep and meaningful theological nuggets, truths, and we set them to music that fill our souls, express our emotions, and transport us beyond that what a sermon can do. We explore sermon series like this one, The Faith We Sing, because we want to grow our awareness of our sung theology to include both the words and the notes, the melodies and the harmonies, and see that it is instructing us, healing us, and moving us through our faith in a powerful way. So yes, my grandfather would have loved sitting down to help with a series like this, where we lean in to the understanding of the faith we sing each week. So far, we have explored globally the songs we sing and the songs that we sing to empower the poor and the oppressed. This week, we're going to explore the scriptural theme of hope and restoration that is often found symbolized in our sacred texts in the form of rivers and living water. It's rather brilliant of our biblical writers to have drawn upon this imagery for the hope and restoration. Because we know that when we are desperate, having fought our way through injustice and struggle, that we are parched for that which brings us life. Water. Water makes up 60% of our own human body. 71% of the Earth's surface is made up of water. It is the basic ingredient of life. We can't live without it. Our need and thirst for clean, life-giving water is instinctual and necessary. So it's not only natural, it has become the driving theme for us that produces hope for restored life in our scripture. The biblical world was rampant with conquering empires and domination. Cultural norms built hierarchies that gave resources to a limited few while subjugating many. Women and children were property. Many persons from other nations, persons who fell upon hard times, well, they were put into slavery without autonomy instead of being supported by the community. Kings sought to be worshiped by their people as if they were God. It was a dangerous time to live, and people needed to envision another way. Hence the vision of John in Revelation, where there is a new heaven and earth, a holy city where God lives among people, gently wiping away tears, removing the fear of death and destruction, where the one on the throne says all things will be made new, and a crystal clear, clear river flows from that throne of this loving divine being that quenches the thirst of all, including trees of life that produce fruit each month, symbolic of the tribes of Israel, the people of God, and then whose leaves were medicine for the healing of the nations. 
It struck me when researching this passage that Reverend Chase W. Cooper argues that many have translated crystal clear water as potentially a poor rendering of the text. Apparently more accurately, or at least one way to translate the passage is to read the word we translate in English as crystal to instead be jasper. Jasper is a smooth, naturally opaque, impure crystal stone. Instead of clear, it's colorful, coming in reds, greens, browns, blues, and other colors. Jasper is regularly mentioned throughout the Bible as it was a precious stone used for sacred purposes. Ray Oliver writes that the understood meaning of this favorite gemstone is it is known as the supreme nurturer and it is said to help achieve a state of calm and zen. It protects your energy by absorbing all the negativity so that it's a great one to have on hand when you're going through a hard time. It's hard to call it coincidence that our text chooses a rock considered to have calming properties able to absorb negativity when the letter is written to a people experiencing an extraordinarily difficult time, being oppressed and ruled by a foreign empire bent on their destruction. So what if this river of life isn't crystal clear, but instead filled with crystals, with color, colors of the rainbow meant to represent the welcome of all? What if instead of purity, this stone, which was considered impure, was a reminder again of the coming together of the nations, Jew and Gentile, the coming together of genders, of classes of people into one, where together they would bring life to all? The river of life that flows through this city, it brings with it healing, a hope for a future unlike the one they were presently experiencing. It symbolically brings people often separated into equal space and supported and heard, united in their oneness, and it radiates light and life for all. Interestingly, when Patrick and I began talking about this theme of the rivers of life and life-giving water found in Scripture, we landed on a conversation about shape notes and sacred harp music. James B. Wallace of Emory University writes in his essay entitled Stormy Banks and Sweet Rivers, a Sacred Harp Geography, that sacred harp was one form of a cappella, shape note music, from the U.S. South. These roots of sacred harp, they extend all the way back to the 18th century New England singing school movement. Sacred harp singing took its strongest hold outside the southern plantation regions, especially in the Piedmont and upcountry. Encouraged by performance practices that represented a more egalitarian ethos. Although considered by most participants to be a form of worship, sacred harp exists independently of official denominational support and it welcomes anyone interested in singing. So I want you to hang in there with me because I'm sure you're wondering, what does sacred harp have to do with rivers of life-giving water? Well, I see both reimagine what our lived experience might be. If rivers of living water symbolize a new way to live, one that brings hope by nurturing creation and humanity and providing healing for the nations, drawing all people into oneness, then sacred harp music helps us to begin to put that oneness into practice. Sacred harp music begun to, was begun to encourage singing and musical participation regardless of someone's educational background. You see, you didn't need to be literate or be able to read music to participate. It created a way for all to be competent to sing communally. It encouraged all to sing. And sacred harp, it isn't sweet, soft harmony. It's bold, it's harsh, it's loud. All voices are encouraged. Those tone deaf and otherwise all had a place in the choir. Women didn't just have to sing women's parts and men sing men's parts. They crossed those binary boundaries. Women singing tenor parts, men singing soprano parts, so that instead of four-part harmony, sacred harp music has six. It wasn't sung as a choir with a congregation where somebody comes to enjoy the music but not participate. All who came participated. The little churches with rows pointing towards the pulpit, well, they were rearranged for occasions, doing away with the architectural concept of the masses coming to listen to the one with knowledge and power. 
pews were put into four sections facing each other, creating a square. And then these people would come and they would sing for hours without an official conductor. Each person who desired to lead took turns leading, men, women, young, old. While it was most prominent in poor white culture in Appalachia, this type of egalitarian singing, it spread its roots into both white and black cultures throughout the South. Now, I'm not trying to paint a picture that says Sacred Heart music undid the harm of Southern culture because it certainly did not. But for those who participated in it, it did for moments help them transcend the cultural norms that oppressed and held many people back. It allowed them to use their voice freely to make music with the community, to cross gender boundaries, to cross educational holdbacks that produce class systems and shame and it enabled leadership opportunities for practically all who wanted to conduct. It was life-giving. It was freeing. It, like the living water of the Crystal River, envisioned a new way to sing and a new way to live life together. And that is what, at its best, singing our faith invites us to do. Envision how life might be, how good and sweet it would be to plant our own roots on the creek bank of living water, where we are nurtured by the leaves of the trees and the oneness all around us, where creation sings to us of a hopeful future, where nations are healed and our spirits are the light to the earth, where there is no more night, no more pain, no more tears except tears of joy, where rivers of jasper and all their colors absorb all the evil and negativity, where the trees and flowers bloom, offering us medicine for our bodies and our souls, where we look upon creation, from the rivers, the rocks, the trees, the animals, the stars, the moons, the colors and diversity of humanity, and we are in awe and wonder at the beauty of the divine expressed in all. And until it is fully so, we will keep singing our faith and envisioning the healing for us all. Thanks be to God. Amen. Please join me in our affirmation of faith. We believe in God, the root of all living, creator of all things. We live in Christ Jesus, God's son, who loved all people, and who makes us one in his love. He suffered and died and was raised to a new life. In his death and resurrection, we are also raised to life that is transformed. Christ is our vine and we are his branches, and without him we cannot live. We live by the Holy Spirit, flowing through us so that we may bear fruit for God, the fruit of love. In the Spirit, we are one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world. We trust in the one holy church, the communing of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the mystery of resurrection, and the grace of eternal life. Amen.
My friends, that life-giving river that flows from the throne of God and the holy city in Revelation, whether it is crystal clear or whether it is full of jasper stones in every color, it is meant to bring us hope that the unity we long for, the calmness that we seek, the love and the freedom we hope to share, it is possible and it is God's promise to all the earth. Thanks be to God. In the name of our Creator, our Savior and Sustainer, Amen.